Hello everyone out there in Blount County and beyond. My name is Melinda and I'm a reference librarian here at the Blount County Public Library in Maryville, Tennessee. Once again, I am so happy to welcome you back to Storytime for Grown-Ups. And as we prepare to honor our veterans this week, I'm especially happy to welcome all of you who have served in our nation's military, uh, as well as your family, friends, and loved ones who truly serve right there along with you. And to honor your service today, we would like to remember the service of one long ago Blount County veteran. Um, as you probably know, um, the original Veterans Day was actually Armistice Day, the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. That was November 11th, 1918, the day on which World War I came to a close. Um, in her November 10th, 1983 column um, in the Daily Times, Elizabeth Timmons, or Tizzy Timmons, as many of you may remember her, uh, shared a letter which was written two days after that original armistice, and it was published in the Maryville Times about a month later in December 1918. It was written by Leslie G. Walker, who was a sergeant in the Battery C of the 114th Field Artillery, and he shares with his father what life was like in those first hours and days of peace following the war to end all wars. Read from the paper, microfilm. It says, Dear Dad, now that an armistice has been agreed upon and peace seems certain, I suppose you are anxious to hear from me. I'm quite well and, of course, happy. Our entire battery came through with only three casualties, notwithstanding we have been in two great offensives, have been shelled repeatedly, and were, at the very moment the armistice went into effect, occupying a position only 800 meters from the German lines and undergoing continuous shell fire. Our battery moved up to this advanced position on the night of the 10th, and on the morning of the 11th, we were shelled from about 6.50 a.m. until 10.40, when the shelling in our immediate neighborhood abated. However, the big guns at various points on the line continued to roar up to the very last minute, and one lone gun fired a shot at 11.01, and by doing so, brought down upon his head thousands of imprecations from the American soldiers, and no doubt the Germans. I have a small shell fragment that glanced off of my helmet during the shelling, which I shall try to bring home as a souvenir. On the morning of the 11th, about 9 a.m., six Germans came across our lines unarmed and surrendered to the doughboys. I talked to one of them through an interpreter, and he assured me that the war was over. We fed them well and sent four of them back. We kept two as one seemed to have valuable information, and the other insisted that he wanted to go to America. That night we came back to our old position, leaving a guard on the guns. I was a little late getting away, and it was dark before I left. Just as soon as night fell, the infantry of both armies began sending up rockets, flares, and very various lights until the whole sky was lit up. The Germans seemed more happy than the Americans. I could hear them cheering every few minutes. On the following day, yesterday afternoon, Coot Verlis Morton, who is an inveterate souvenir hunter, told me he was going over to see the Germans and get some souvenirs, so I decided to go with him. We started about 2.30 p.m., taking a shortcut that led us through our second-line trenches and over about 40 barbed wire entanglements. Lord pity the man who has to cross them under fire. About 3.30 p.m., we came to our guns, and the boys on guard warned us that we had better not go into the German lines as both sides were taking prisoners. We had our automatics with us and so told, told them we would take a chance. We went through a large village where there has been frequent street fighting in the last few days. After passing through the village, we came to some old French trenches, and about 50 feet farther facing them were some old German trenches, relics of a time when they stood for a few days apart and threw hand grenades for pastime. The Americans seldom fought that way. We either took their trench or lost ours. 
Usually we took theirs. A few minutes later, we came to a fresh German grave with its cross decorated with a floral design made of fine wire, painted and surmounted by a winged cherub. All around us now we saw signs of Germans, such as German hand grenades, parts of German uniforms, helmets, etc. Passing on across a meadow that reminded us very much of a Tennessee river bottom, we jumped a jackrabbit which Morton threw into a panic by knocking its footing from under it with a shot from his automatic. And a little later, scared up a covey of partridges that went off with a whirr, just like they do back home. We came at length to the German barbed wire entanglements. Crossing these, we headed for a German pillbox, perhaps a hundred yards from the entanglements. These pillboxes are square concrete structures about 14 by 14 feet inside with walls about two feet thick, roof the same or perhaps thicker. On the front and flanks are slits through which machine guns could be fired. Something like 50 yards from this pillbox was a semicircle of holes facing our lines. These holes were just deep enough for a man to stand in and operate a rifle or light machine gun. A pillbox supported in this manner is a nasty thing for infantry to encounter. Up to this time, we had seen no Germans, and to be quite frank, I had no intention of walking into their lines, but I thought that if we could see one or two of them, we could motion to them and try to get them to meet us halfway. We walked on toward the pillbox, stepped round the corner, and found ourselves right in the midst of a group of Germans. It is hard to realize that we're not to shoot at this slate gray uniform anymore, and before I knew it, my hand was on my automatic. I jerked it away rather guiltily when I saw that the Germans were entirely unarmed. Morton knows a few words of German, and he tried them on the group, with the result that they all came forward offering to shake hands with us, which we did. There were eight or ten in the group, and we stayed with them for some time, exchanging buttons and coins. We carried on a sort of conversation, mixing German, French, English, and signs, they all assured us that the war was over. I saw a German rifle lying on the ground, and picking it up, I showed it to one of them, saying, Allemand? He said, Ja. Yeah. Then I looked on the side and saw that it was made in Berlin in 1916. When I threw it down, this German stepped up, stamped upon it, and threw his hands out and upward with a look of disgust upon his face, evidently meaning that he was through with the contemptible thing. By this time, the sun had gone down, so we told our German friends goodbye. They insisted upon shaking hands again, every one of them assuring us that we were comrades. On our way back, we saw a partridge lying dead a few feet from a shell crater, evidently killed by the explosion. We saw many other evidences of the horrors of war, much more gruesome than this, and I don't blame the Germans for celebrating the end of it, even if they did lose. And they were celebrating. They were still sending up flares and rockets and throwing hand grenades like firecrackers so that it reminded me of an old-fashioned Fourth of July celebration back in the States. A Frenchman and some Americans were talking to a group of Germans after 11 o'clock on the 11th, and the Frenchman showed one of the Germans a picture of Paris. He turned to his comrades, showed them the picture, and said something in German. Then he turned to us and said in English, Paris? Christmas? Remember? We laughed, and the Germans joined in. They seem able to appreciate a joke, even if it is on them. But I didn't finish telling about our walk. That is all we saw of the Germans, but a good share of the pleasure came at the end of the trip, when we found that Cook Roy Walker had saved us a good supper of beefsteak and tomato pudding with real sugar. Of course, I don't know when we will get to come home, but after talking to these Germans, I feel pretty sure that the war is over. And I certainly hope that when our job is done over here, they won't detain us long. There is a rumor current now that we are to occupy Metz. If we do go there, I will no doubt have some very interesting things to relate about the trip. Hoping to see you all in a short time, and trusting this will find you unscathed by Spanish flu. I am your affectionate son, Leslie.
Well, I am happy to report that Sergeant Walker was able to return home safely to Tennessee. And he worked for many years in Maryville as a businessman. And in his retirement, he actually wrote a column for the Maryville Enterprise for several years and eventually uh, collected some of those articles in this book called Born in a Split-Level House. Um, it has many charming stories, and it includes some more about his experiences during World War I. And if you would like to see the book, we would be happy to help you locate it in genealogy. And of course, if you would like to reread his letter, we'll be happy to help you find it on our microfilm of the Daily Times newspapers. Or um, it is also uh, in um, a book published by the uh, Blount County Genealogical and Historical Society, which gathered Tizzy's, Tim, Tizzy Timmons' columns, and it's called Tizzy's Corner Revisited. So we would like to give special thanks to the Daily Times uh, for giving us permission uh, to share Tizzy's article and the letter. We are so grateful to them and also to the Blount County Genealogical and Historical Society for allowing us to share resources like the books and the memorabilia which they have from World War I. Both the Times and the Genealogy Society do so much to help record preserve and share our local history, and we are so grateful to them. Of course, we would also like to thank you so much for joining us for Storytime for Grown Ups today. And most of all, to our veterans and your loved ones, a simple thank you never seems like quite enough, but it is from the heart. We want to thank you so much for your selflessness, for your service, and for your sacrifice. Your example will forever inspire a grateful nation. Thank you. Mm -hmm.